Good afternoon again. Thank you for coming. Uh, I can see that my uh, yesterday's advertisement worked well. So uh, <laughs> today uh, I would like to introduce to you the first philosopher in Poland, Vitello, who was the most eminent scholar of the pre university period in Poland. He came from Silesia. May I ask for the next? Oh, yes, here we have Silesia map. The map on the left shows Poland how it looks today, right? Mm -hmm. And the pink page on the left, on the southwest, is Silesia area. Right? You can see it. Can you see it? Okay. So, uh, this is where Vitello was born, and this is where he was active, but not only that. And the map on the right, shows uh, how this Silesia area was divided in the 13th century by the local princes. Uh, the most important part of Silesia was Wrocław because there was, it was a seat of the Episcopal authorities. Okay, so this is the background. <coughs> and against this background, we can discuss the figure of Vitel. He was born in 1230, most probably in Legnica, and the death of his birth and of his death are not certain, not 100% certain, but uh, it's easier with his birth and most more difficult with his death, because some sources say that he died in the year 1280, and the others that he died 35 years later. So 35 years is quite a long period of time, right? Uh, why this situation is so complicated? Because we have traces of his activity, the last traces of his activity in the year 1280, but in the year 1314, we know that the Holy Mass for his soul was celebrated in the church. So, <laughs> we don't know if he really was active during these 30 years before this Mass was celebrated, or maybe he died and the Mass, uh, he died 30 years earlier, and the Mass was just one out of many in a row. So we cannot go forward. But this is really not the most important uh, issue when discussing a philosopher. He was a son of a Polish woman and a German, col German, German colonist from Thuringia. He spoke of himself as a filius Turingorum et Polonorum, which indicates that he was aware of his mixed German-Polish origins. But he also once wrote a phrase in the Nostra Terra Stilicet Polonia, which means in our land, namely in Poland. The beginnings of his education are connected to the monastery school in Legnica. He may have become a priest or a monk there, then he studied liberal arts and philosophy in Paris. He was quite closely associated with Wrocław since he stayed on the courts of prince and bishop there and he became uh, a kind of a spiritual guide to one of the princes um, in the 50s of the 13th century he studied in Paris then in the 60s he studied in Padua in Padua he studied law, philosophy and sciences in autumn 1268 he set off to Viterbo near Rome where he met Wilhelm of Merbecke, who was a really important figure because he was a collaborator of Thomas Aquinas. Vitello read the Wilhelm's translations of ancient Greek texts and wrote his best known study, Perioptikes, which means a perspective. And I think that the cover of the first printed edition of the Perspectiva we can see right here. In a moment we will focus on this picture, but for now let's talk about Wilhelm. Uh, the, the title of this book was very long, certainly. Vitalonis Mathematici Doctissimi Peri Opticus, it is the natura ratione et projectione radiorum visus luminum colorum at performarum quam burgo perspectivam vocant libri tetzer. Which means Vitello highly learned mathematics about optics, that is, the nature, cause and incidence of rays of vision, light, colors and shapes, which they commonly call perspectiva, ten books, ten books. And let's move to the next slide. Um, I'm not sure if you can see 
means I did my best to uh, enlarge it. Is it better? Yes. Yeah. So, this is the engraving of the cover of the first edition of Vitello's The Perspectiva. Uh, it was published in the publishing house Petreus, and you can see here that the publisher was really aware what is inside the book. Because we can see, on, or we should see, on this image, uh, some special phenomena related to the light. Here is the rainbow, right? Here you can see fire. Here is a person holding uh, a large lamp, lamp, and the sun rays cause this fire burn, right? Another thing is here man at the mirror, right? Here we have a man who stands with his feet under water, and if you look at it more closely, you can see that his feet look like if they were not uh, straight, like in a real man, because this is the illusion of light. And here we have also two boxes, and they have the same size, but the one which is on the top, which is not lying on the floor like this, seems a little bit bigger. But in fact, their, their size is the same. I don't know what was this phenomenon, but it's not really essential for our today's talk. Okay, so, and this first edition, which was published in 1535, played a very important part in publishing Copernicus' work, The Revolutionibus, and why I will return to this issue later. So, here we have this De Perspectiva. This work was dedicated to Wilhelm of Merbeck. Vitello knew his translations of fundamental Aristotle's works, his translation of Proclus' elements of theology, and commentaries to Plato's Parmenides. But much more important for Vitello were the texts by Herod of Alexandria and Archimedes. It is highly probable that it was Vitello who prompted Wilhelm of Merbeke to translate some of Archimedes' texts into Latin. And in turn, Vitello was persuaded by Wilhelm of Merbeke to compose the Perspectiva. And Vitello dedicated this book to Wilhelm, and this phrase is significant because it goes as follows. To the lover of truth, to brother Wilhelm of Merbeke, with wishes of blessed seeing the eternal light with an unbroken beam of intellect and of a clear comprehension of what is written below. <laughs> right? So it's a dedication for someone to understand well the book to which is dedicated to him. Having written the Perspectiva, Vitello became involved in diplomatic initiatives. He took part in General Council in Lyon. He was a deputy of Prince Henry IV, uh, and he also had many other diplomatic activities. But let's focus on the last one, that he was probably, in the last years of his life, were probably devoted to teaching at the school at the Church of St. Peter and Paul in Legnica, and then he was perhaps involved in the reform of this institution because he intended to turn this school into some kind of an academic school. And if Vitello had been successful, we would have the university in this part of Poland um, a, century, a century prior to the Krakow University. But it was, this initiative was not successful. He was a naturalist, mathematician, and philosopher. Um, I spoke about his perspective, but what is important for us today is his letter which deals with the matters of practical philosophy. The letter on the demons. On the, demons. the letter was intended to help confessors and to help priests, but in fact it contains Vitello's methodological premises and their application to the question of the demons. Uh, everything, um, oh, we can skip this, ah, this is important. Vitello knew well the writings of, um, in many books you can read that Vitello knew well the writings of Plato and Aristotle, but it should be remarked that only the writings that were available at that time, and those were really not many works of these ancient philosophers, but he also knew some works by Alcibius, he knew the works of Robert Grosseteste, Roger Bacon, Albert the Great, and 
some pieces by Thomas Aquinas. But what is even more important, he knew the writings of the Arabs, Al Ghazal, and Avicenna. For him, Neoplatonism and Arabs were the source of the so called metaphysics of life, which is the general philosophical context for Wittelow's optics. He distinguished between divine light and sensual light, considering the latter as a carrier of action into material reality. He shared Aristotle's genetic empiricism, saying that there is nothing in the, in the intellect that was not previously in the senses. Uh, he clearly separated faith from knowledge or philosophy from theology in a way similar to Latin averroists. In general, Vitello's psychology and philosophical anthropology, and in particular his teaching on the soul, and especially the distinction between vegetative, sensory, and mental functions of the soul, are the continuation of Aristotelian thought. On the other hand, the cosmos, according to Vitello, is organized hierarchically, with God as the first beginning, first cause, first life, the life over the lights, and so on, and we have elements of creationism and emanationism, combined as a fusion of Neoplatonism and Christian Aristotelianism. It seems that Vitello combined Parisian Aristotelian tradition and Patevian naturalist teaching. As for optics as a part of physics, he treated optics mathematically, even in the form of an axiomatic system, which was supplemented by experimental, <coughs> uh, by experimental foundations. He mainly dealt with the refraction of light when passing from one center of density to another, as we have here this man in the water, when the sun passes from air to water between two centers of virus density. He was a man of the world with interesting acquaintances, educated at two universities and well familiar with the works of great scholars. Uh, his work, although it is somewhat eclectic, exerted a significant impact, being one of the most interesting natural and mathematical treatises produced in the Middle Ages, and was still read diligently by Leonardo da Vinci and then by Johannes Kepler at the turn of the 17th century, who commented and supplemented Vitello's calculations. Uh, okay, so, so much for the initial background, so much for the introduction. Let's move to the letter on the demons. The, the demons, which is most likely not the very, and not very important and the foremost subject of philosophy in the 21st century, right? But in this subject, we can see how Vitello applied his methodological premises, what were his results, and why, at least why I think, that his thought is still worth reconsidering today, to some extent, at least. When uh, I was encouraged by, my by the success of my yesterday's presentation to prepare another presentation, and I was tempted to adorn this presentation with the pictures of demons from the internet, but I decided that you can easily find them and it would be better to focus on the text itself because the text is still the main source, the main material source for the historian of philosophy. So, here we have the opening phrase of the Vitilov's letter, right? Very meaningful phrase, and I think we will all, all adhere to this opinion that the question of the substance and nature of demons is difficult. Oh yes, this is difficult. But anyway, we will try to solve it. Why is it difficult? Uh, because, as Vitello says, known or almost known of the philosophers that were read by him wrote anything on this subject, only with the exception of Plato and some of his followers who touched this problem in their writings, but only very briefly and imperfectly. Uh, Vitello himself, when attempting to give a thought or to research this subject, he encountered numerous difficulties, and he must have realized that, in fact, he had crossed the line between philosophy and theology, because, as you can see, he declared that he doesn't want to question the principles of the holy Christian religion. If such a declaration was necessary, then it proves that he, mm, 
at least could have appeared to question these principles. So he declares, I do not want to question them, but to examine the nature of demons only via naturalem, via naturalem et possibile. Uh, only in this naturalist method, in the mode of possibility. And this is a very essential phrase for Vitello, because it means that he clearly tries to separate theological considerations from his own naturalist research, and moreover, he ascribes to his conclusions only a hypothetical validity. So, his conclusions, he says, are only hypotheses. We cannot be sure of them. Right? Because if he presented them as true, that would oppose Christian religion. Uh, and what does this via naturalem mean in this case? It means by forces of nature. By forces of nature, that is, using perceptions, experience and intellect, and excluding divine revelation or holy scripture. So let's follow the Vitello, let's follow Vitello on his via naturalis. Uh, or maybe one more word of a comment to this via, natu to this via naturalis. This sounds as an echo of the theory which was ascribed to the Averroist thinkers. Uh, the so-called theory of double truth that was for the first time articulated, in fact, in an act of condemnation which was issued in the year 1277 by Paris Bishop Etienne Tempierre. But in fact, but the fact that the bishop articulated this theory of double truth, let's call it like this, uh, means that in the previous decades this theory was applied in teaching by philosophers at the faculty of philosophy. Because it must have taken some time to be observed and to be condemned. And this could be, this could happen that Vitello was in Paris when this practice of teaching in the faculty of philosophy, of teaching philosophy via naturalis, was applied by philosophers. Um, okay. uh, so, he articulated some objections against religious doctrine of demons as fallen angels, and nolens volens, he entered the area of theology and revelation with his philosophical instruments. And let's go. Let's follow his reasoning. He says, but even if faith taught that the fall of angels was necessary, natural reason and the order of the universe tells us that it is not possible. Right? So, the faith teaches that the fall of angels was necessary, but natural reason says something opposite to what faith says. And Vitello followed this way of thinking and applied his natural, inborn intellect and the sense of, sense of observation of the cosmic order to undermine the teaching about fallen angels. And he also applied Aristotelianism to help him in this task. There are eight arguments of Vitello against the possibility of angels to fall, and uh, I will present you only, only some of them. The first argument is very simple, and this is in fact an argument from simplicity. The nature of angels, says Vitello, is pure, not complex, simple. For the fall of such beings is impossible, because only material <coughs> being can fall. Spiritual being, which is simple, not complex, not material, cannot fall at all. This is his first argument. The second, okay, the fourth. Okay, let's focus on the fifth one. He says, God's will is constant and immutable. Since his will created these natures, namely the angels, then his will couldn't have changed in the process of preserving their existence. Because God's will acts in one indivisible moment of time. So in this one indivisible moment of time, God couldn't have changed his mind about angels. So, they cannot fall. Such substances cannot fall. Uh, and the final argument, if a fall, as we all uh, mean by fall, changing a place from the higher position to the lower position, 
So if a fall is considered as a change of place, so this is impossible for pure substances because they do not occupy any place at all. So Vitello concludes, the fall of angels is impossible and the Christian faith is wrong, is wrong, but only if it's examined in this natural way by... Um, okay, the, the, can you return to the previous one? Uh, if we examine the doctrine of the fallen angels on via naturalis, then this is impossible. So this is nonsense for philosophers, the doctrine of fallen angels. And does Vitello really intend to refute religious beliefs? Such a question must be put here. Probably not, before he, before he claim, because he claims that these, his arguments are only philosophical and they lose their validity on the ground of religion and faith. And they can be easily refuted without refutation, dismissed without argument, by faith as faith. Religious belief does not need any proofs. If faith was substantiated by reasoning, then it would have no merit. Holy's picture speaks of the demons only metaphorically, and we cannot understand it literally. So, faith is just has one doctrine, and philosophers have the other doctrine. And in this, at least, I can see some echo, some resemblance of this theory of double truth. Of double truth. Uh, so much for religion, says Vitello. He appears to accept religious teaching. Well, he was a Christian, right? So he has to accept it, at least verbally. But in fact, he goes to investigate it philosophically. Yes. Uh, since I investigate this question by natural means, says Vitello, I shall answer it on the same level, naturaliter, naturaliter. In this way, naturaliter, at first, Vitello observed a contradiction of etymology and of common and professional usage of the word demon. Because etymological, etymological explanation of the nature of demons resulted in considering them to be knowing science in Latin, and in this respect Vitello, as many others before him, derived the origins of the word daimon from Greek participium daemon, which means knowing, experience, but he observed as well that the word demon is usually used by the people as some evil spirit, as some ugly spirit, as some malicious creature, uh, and as a naturalist, he divided all such demons, being creatures of surprising appearance, in two categories. Some of the demons, and let's move to the two categories, two types of demons. Some of the demons, um, more common, do not perform any real actions, apart from making sounds, but it's also very rare. And the others, are, which are extremely rare, pursue actions that have some material, natural, Right, so we have two types of demons, and we will investigate both types starting with the first one. Vitello explains the appearances showing up of these demons with his medical knowledge. And maybe today this sounds a little bit funny, but for the 13th century it was a deeply scientific medical knowledge. Let me quote a piece. <sighs> Sometimes a disease comes from the illness of the diaphragm, from stomach, from uterus, or other organs. And this is due to the close connection of the nerves to the brain. The rotten fumes from these organs reach the brain and destroy it, and thus cause madness. From, for the ability to think lies mainly in the brain. So, if you have an uh, ill stomach, be careful because it can result in madness. So if you have ill stomach, go to the specialist before he will uh, direct you to the brain specialist. Right? So do not uh, or treat all the symptoms with care. Right? And this quote 
probably funny for us today, is sufficient to provide an example of Vitello's scientific explanation of the phenomenon of the demon that is caused by malfunction of human organism. He even indicates the illnesses and the balance between white and black fluids in human body that produce vision of angels and those that produce visions of demons. So if you have more black fluids, you are more likely to see devil. If you have white fluids, you are more likely to see angels. Right? Because it's all in your brain, it's all in your mind. This is all, I, I'm saying your, but it's also mine, right? It's all human condition. Another explanation of the demons in this category, which do not perform real actions, is extremely vivid imagination that comes to the fore, for example, when people are, are in love, in love, or are influenced by passion for a beloved woman and man. For their imagination imposes some forms on sensus communis and this sense provides people with vivid images. The same happens to the people who are overwhelmed with excessive fear. But the medical advice in this case is very simple and well known in philosophy. It is therefore, Vitello says, it is therefore recommended, and this advice is important, to brush such thoughts aside and to seek consolation in the company of friends. So try not to be too emo emotional in love or in fear because it may cause you, for example, see your beloved in the street or see someone who you fear in a dark room. Right? So be careful. Be careful. And another practical recommendation in this regard to prevent such demons from showing up was to refrain from telling fairy tales to children and to stupid people, says Vitalas. For such stories about demons are easily accepted and they consequently stimulate imagination and the imagination produces images of such demons. So be careful to whom you tell the story about demons because it may destroy their imagination and consequently their lives. When children think of such stories in secluded and dark places and their imagination produces such phantoms. The same thing happens, says Vitello, to very religious people. Take a, take a look. At one hand, he discusses on the same level children and stupid people, and on the same level, religious people. So the same thing happens to very religious people, whose imagination produces visions of God and angels. Um, okay, that's all for this I, uh, imagination factor in producing demons. Scientific explanations of demons go even farther. For Vitello referred to his favorite subject, that is, to the optics, and enumerated some examples of optical illusions that produce images of people or animals of extraordinary size. He retold some stories of hunters who saw wolves of the size of a tree and considered this animal to be a terrifying demon. He uh, describes such a story, a blackboard would be wonderful, this, uh, respect right now, but uh, no, no, no. Let uh, let's imagine that here we can see a hunter who is climbing a mountain at the sunrise, right? And here he can see a wolf, and further there are there is a wall of trees, the forest, right? So he is very when he sees this wolf, so he may see it on the background of the forest, and. The optical illusion may cause him to see this wolf of the size of a tree. So he can be very easily... This was a big one. So he can be very easily convinced that he can see an animal of an extraordinary size and what it is? Demon. Right? So optical illusions are another cause of people seeing demons. So what should we do? Let's move to the next slide to remove the demons of the first type. Four pieces of advice. First, consult your doctor. Second, bring your imagination under control. Three, do not be carried away by love or fear. And four, learn natural sciences. Learn. So go to the doctor, learn and don't be too emotional. 
These are the pieces of advice to which I think most of the ancient philosophers would su subscribe. Unfortunately, these recommendations do not solve all human problems with demons, for there is still the other category of demons that appear very extremely rarely, but bring about natural effects. Let's go to that. Yes, the demons of the second type bring about natural effects, and their existence is demonstrated by ratio et experimento. So, now we arrive at the serious stuff. No illusions anymore. Uh, what are the arguments that demons like this exist? Again, we have with Vitello a list of arguments. The first argument is that many people sometimes simultaneously at once see strange characters. And this cannot be explained by their imagination, right? Because every human being has one's own imagination. So they must see something real. If there are many people under illusion, let's uh, say in other words, if many people are under illusion, most likely this is not an illusion. This could be something real. Uh, another argument. Vitello says that incubi et succubi, that means demons of male and female gender, or maybe not really gender, but only of female form, or of male and female form, were observed to produce tactile effects. And yet, imagination does not produce such effects. And moreover, Vitello reported on something really strange, that can really arise imagination. For example, he says, I was told by someone who deserved to be trusted, this is the way of spreading the gospel, I was told by someone who can be trusted uh, about a certain castle where a beautiful lady was staying who copulated with many incubi that arrived there. So he was told about the lady who copulated with many male demons. Right? So, if this really happened, so the demon must be some kind of a material creature. Because the act of copulation is impossible with purely spiritual creatures. So what is the demon of the second category? He brings about natural effects. Uh, and commenting on this, with the, on this gossip, which was, uh, of course, um, rendered by someone who deserved to be trusted. Commenting on this, Vitello took an opportunity to make a spiteful <coughs> remark about theologians. For he says, Plato, in a way, explains the problem of demons, but theologians ex escape the problem with beautiful excuses. <coughs> The third argument comes from medieval mythology. Vidal refers to the well-known sorcerer Merlin, I'm sure you've heard about him, who was a sorcerer from Arturian legends and who was considered to be a cambion, that is, an offspring of a demon and a human. So, if he was born like a human being and if he was an offspring of a demon, so his birth must have been preceded by a material act of copulation, by a sexual act. So, demons are material. And these arguments were followed by some more that stemmed from Plato's authority and from ancient Plato commentator Alcidius. Uh, let's skip some of this text and let's now. Um, which slide is the next? Okay. So, these numbers right now, I think they don't tell you anything, but in a moment it will become clear how mathematical structure of the universe proves the necessity of the existence of demons. But copyright would be. Vitello was a philosopher, scientist, and naturalist who was able to extract scientific substance from Plato and Chalcides, and first he accepted the assumption of mathematical cosmic harmony. The view that the order of the universe is perfect and complete and based on harmony of cubic numbers and on the fact that between every two cubic extremes you can see two, uh, what's the mathematical term, 
2 cubic is 8, 2 multiplied by 2 and by 2 again is 8, and 3 multiplied by 3 and by 3 again is 27. Right? Basic mathematics. So, and this is the proof of the necessity of the existence of demons, but let's uh, take a closer look at it. Um, between the two extremes, there must be two middle. And therefore, world is always in its most fundamental structure composed of four series of beings. For example, such a theory of four elements is an example of a theory which accepts this fundamental fourfold structure of the world. Right? You know, this theory of four elements from Greek philosophy. And so, between two extremes, between 27 represent here, represents here separate intelligences, pure spirits, and 8 represents here material beings, there must be some intermediate factors, intermediate elements. In order to save the harmony of the universe, these elements must be two. And number 12 represents what? Human beings. But between human beings and animals and material beings, there is only very short, what, very short line, very short step of perfection, right? Very little step of perfection, represented by number four. Why? Between man, which is 12, and be between human being, which is 12, and separate intelligences, which are 27, we have a very large piece of a step of perfection, right? So there must be something in the middle. And we will focus on number 18 in a moment. What is it? To be precise, these are the demons who have something common with animals because they have bodies and senses, though their, their bodies are very sublime, but contrary to the animals, they enjoy pure cognition similar to that of pure intelligences. All these proportions stem from fundamental mathematical structure of the world, which is the following. If we take the first cube from the first number, and uh, we must keep in mind that in fact for ancient and medieval philosophers, two is the first number, because one is not a number. One is not a number and was not a number for Pythagorean philosophers. It was just a brick, just an element out of which the numbers are built. So the first number is 2. If we take this second cube from the second number, which is 3, we have these numbers 8 and 27. And between them we have two middle proportional numbers, 12 and 18. And there is another sign of cosmic hierarchy between these numbers, because please observe the relations between them. 12 is 1 8 and half of 8, right? 8 and 4. 18 is 12 and half of the 12, right? 12 and 6 is 18. And the same with 27. 27 is composed of 18 and half of 18. That is 9, right? 18 plus 9 makes 27. So this is a fundamental cosmic theory. And Vitelli, when he commented on these calculations, he said such a he concluded in this way. This is Plato's mathematical proof, to which I completely agree, if Christian faith is not taken into account. So, I agree with it completely, but unfortunately, he says, we have Christian faith. So, if we do not have Christian faith, if we do not take it into account, Plato says something true about the structure of the universe. Uh, and following these calculations, Vitello presented more arguments for his concept of demons. Yes, yet the text is not clear in here because the manuscript was spoiled and the commentators and editors uh, give some uh, various hints about the text. But what, exist, what uh, results from these calculations for sure is that if 12 is a human being, which is closer in his nature, in the nature of human being, to animals which have no intellect. So there must be something between human being and pure intellects and pure substances. 
and pure spirits, which are the number 27. And Vitello says, these are the demons. Demons who have bodies, but their bodies are very subtle. Their bodies are composed not like human bodies, mostly of water and earth, but the bodies of demons following... This is... Vitello's theory is based on Aristotle's physics. The demons are composed of the air. And another argument of Vitello is, we see demons very rarely, but we cannot be sure if in this room there is not a demon sitting, right, and listening to this lecture. Because if the demon is composed of air, so when you move your hand, you may touch the demon without feeling it, right? Because his body is made of air, right? So, and the demons, Vitello says, uh, have very subtle bodies, contrary to human bodies, and they, being close to uh, pure intelligences, to pure substances, pure spirits, the demons enjoy a very similar cognition to them. Demons do not have to think in human way, do not have to proceed in thinking, right? They just have some kind of a purer cognition closer to pure substances. Uh, and let's go to the next slide. This is the video's conclusion. I believe that from the point of view of the natural reason, natural reason all the time, natural reason, demons are animals consisting of body and soul, and it results both from the harmonious order of the universe and from the potentialities of matter and the efficient cause. Are the demons numerous? How many demons are there? In one species, Vitello says, if demons copulate, then every species of demons must have many representatives. They live longer. But why they live longer? Because their bodies are more subtle. And since their bodies are more subtle, the demons do not have to eat much. Right? These were his considerations. The consequences of such Aristotle, based on Aristotle's physics, strict theory of demons. Um, okay, to come to the conclusion, uh, what time do I have to finish? Uh, excellent. Uh, let me quote maybe two or three out of eight arguments of Vitello of those people who may oppose his theory of demons. For example, uh, oh, let's take a look at argument three. If a demon is more sublime substance than human, someone might say, it is more pure being by closer connection to separate substances. And that's true. So, how can a demon cause sin in humans? When even humans who pursue acts in accordance with intellect do not sin. And here on the margin, let me remark that this was another thesis which was uh, articulated by these Latin Averroist philosophers, namely by Boethius of Dacia, who wrote a piece about the life, about uh, the happiness in the life of a philosopher, and he said in it that true philosopher cannot sin if he acts according to his reason. And this was very dangerous claim, because it meant that someone can live, live a sinless life without any help of faith. That the natural reason is sufficient not to commit sins, right? So it means, consequently, that the church was necessary. That the religious faith uh, was unnecessary. Was unnecessary not to sin. Not to sin. And Stefan Tempier, the Bishop of Paris, also observed the danger in this sentence. But uh, let's go back to the question of demons. And the Vitello's answer that demons can cause, to the charge that the demons can cause sin in humans, is the following. Although demons are indeed more sublime substances than people and are not so much polluted with matter, an incubus, that is, the male demon, from a lower air layer, from a lower air layer can cause the 
desire, copulate and procreate. And Vitello follows and uh, provides an analogy. He says, it resembles a man, a human being, but this he means here a man, a male human being although is the noblest substance among the complex sensual beings, yet, against nature, a man sometimes copulates with lower animals than himself, for example, goat or sheep, right? So this is the case of the demon. Vitello says, if sometimes men do things like this, so demon can also copulate with a lower species, with a lower being, that is human being. Therefore, Vitello says, such a demon and such a human being who finds pleasure in such an act, uh, he finds pleasure in it because of excessive tendency to sensory pleasure. And only very few people, uh, although in terms of their substance they are more material than demons, it happens to very few people that they prophesy and see God. So, very few demons tend to fall and commit such things with lower beings. With lower beings. Okay. Another thing. If demon is an animal, then it must have some animal organs. Especially if it is able to procreate. So, some <coughs> organs are indispensable. The question is, what, is it, what are the shapes? What is the form of a demon? And demons are usually seen in human form. But again, Vitello refers to his uh, experience of a con as a confessor. He says that once in Padua, a woman confessed that she has a coitus with a horned goat that disappeared after the act and was never seen again. And it happened in the year 1262. Well, we have then some testimonies. How does Vitello reply? Human knowledge of animal organs, says Vitello, is very limited, only to some examined species, and nothing certain can be said about organs of the demons' bodies. I also claim, says Vitello, that the shapes under which they appear to people, uh, form, demon forms these shapes artificially, just like people wear masks and dresses. And it is even easier for demons, because it's much easier to shape the air which is the substance of demons, than water and air, which is the substance of human beings, right? So it's easier for them. Uh, and one more, let me, let me quote the final argument, another cavil, uh, which involves an instance of a human possessed by a demon. People possessed by demons tell strange things. They predict the future sometimes, they know the past, they speak various languages. For example, again, Vitello says, in Poland there was once a woman who talked in many languages to the presbyter in Legnica, yet she never learned these languages. So she must have been possessed by a demon. And the problem is, if demon is an animal and human being and a woman is an animal as well, how can we be at the same time in one place, right? How this possession may take place. And Vitello's answer to this cavil is very naturalist and medical. He says, um, a possession of human bodies by demons can be explained with medical conditions. It can also be attributed to demons, Roundworms and other parasites, which are animals, they live and reside in human body. So, if a parasite can live in human body, the same can do the demon. Live in a human body, but the symptoms are quite different. Right? The symptoms are different. People speak in various languages, predict the future, and so on and so on. Okay, so what is this? Is let it be the final, I think this is the final slide from the details. Oh, let's uh, leave this the choices here. Uh, what is the most important, in my opinion at least, what is the more important conclusion of Vitello's reasoning? I think that we have to stress that although all these, or maybe not all, but at least some of his examples 
are ridiculous. I can see you smiling when you hear about these copulations and these goals and so on and so forth. And that's fine. But please consider it once again from the 13th century perspective. This is a medical knowledge. This is moreover this naturalis, via naturalis, to learn from experiment, to learn from the facts, from the observations, and to apply your reasoning to these observations to formulate interesting conclusions. So, Vitello's theory of demons is based on medical knowledge of his times, is based on the best physical knowledge of his times, that is Aristotle, is based on his own research in optics, right? And therefore, he concluded in a very, a very interesting theory, which divides demons into two categories, one being the illusion, and the other extremely rarely appearing to humans being an animal. And also, please remember this reasoning with numbers, with calculations. Vitello says, there is a fundamental mathematical structure of the world, and in this structure something would be missing if we remove demons from this structure, right? Okay. So, uh, oh, okay, I, I have here one more remark about philosophy and local philosophy and local elements, because as you've heard, Vitello referred to the examples of the hunters of the area where he lived, of the women who spoke various languages in this part of Poland. So he was able to combine the elements of theoretical philosophy, which he learned at the university in Paris, with his everyday practice as a priest in his area, right? He tried to uh, combine these two elements together, and it resulted in such a wonderful theory. Okay, that is all for uh, the nature of demons, but let me uh, add a few remarks about the posthumous life of Vitello. Uh, you have seen previously on this slide the cover of, his, of the first edition, The Perspective. Uh, <coughs> Copernicus spent the last days of his life in Frankfurt, and in 1539, four years after this treatise was published, was in a printed form, uh, a young scholar from Switzerland visited him. This was Joachim Reticus, and he brought as a gift for Copernicus five works, five wonderful scientific treatises, three of them being published by Petreus, and one of them being Vitello's work. What was it? Why did he bring these books with him? These books were to convince Copernicus to publish finally his De Revolutionibus, but not to publish it anywhere, but to publish it at the publishing house Petreus, because one of these books was also the elements of Euclid. And in this way, Reticus wanted to convince Copernicus that publishing house Petraeus is, has a very good skills, good abilities, and good instruments to publish scientific treatises. And we have to admit that Reticus was successful. And the first edition of the Revolutionibus by Copernicus appeared in print in the same, by the same publisher as this Vitilov's treatise. Uh, to move to the, 20th, to the 21st century, you can see here the faces of famous Polish people. On the left top, there is Vitello. And this portrait of Vitello uh, was used during the 8th Congress of Polish Philosophy in the year, in the year 2008, I believe, but I didn't know. I was there. <laughs> but I forgot to write down the date. Most likely it was in 2008. Uh, and Vitello was kind of a patron of this Congress of Philosophy. And uh, he was not only a patron, but he also, there was a motto of this Congress taken from his book Perspectiva. And let's move to the next slide. In Polish, it uh, sounded, żadnej rzeczy nie widzi się w niej właściwej wielkości which is to some extent ambiguous, because it can mean nothing can be seen in accurate size, right proportion, but also in its true greatness. And uh, 
organizing committee of this philosophical congress, they probably meant that also Polish philosophy is not seen in its true greatness. Right? Uh, and so, uh, let's move to the next slide. As for the life of Vitello in the 21st century, this is a monument of Vitello, which is uh, at the... This is a, an institution of higher education. I don't know if I can call it university, probably not, because they only grant BA uh, degrees. But uh, this institution is in Legnica, and Vitello is its patron. And let's move to the final slide, which was very surprising for me. While preparing this lecture, I tried to uh, research internet to find something interesting, to find some face, some picture of Vitello. And what I found, that a few years ago, a mas Masonic Lodge was founded and named by Vitello. But since we realized that uh, they believe that Ex Oriente Lux, the light comes from the east, the Vitello who researched the light is quite a good patron, I have to admit. You can apply to this lodge by email. <laughs> Maybe. I try to do this, I'll tell you about the result. Okay, so this is the story of the first philosopher in Poland who was critical towards theology, towards religion, who wanted to solve philosophical problems in a philosophical way, meaning philosophy in the 13th century. And as you can see, his life continues.
magical uh, world view. Magical view. Uh, uh -huh. yeah. Well, this is like a little bit of consolation, but not only one nation in Europe lives in such a magical reality. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hmm. I don't think that uh, Vitello's advice would be treated seriously by TV producers. Because, as you say, this show has a wide audience, right? So it makes a lot of money. So money, in this case, uh, is a very strong uh, counter-argument against Hitler's theory of illusions and so on and so on. I don't think that uh, you could come with Vitello's letter in one hand to the central of this TV station and tell them you're selling illusions. Stop doing it. It won't work. But uh, maybe, from another perspective, if we consider demons metaphorically, no, because we're considering them on uh, the, the, this theory of demons as animals, which is founded on Aristotelian physics, of course, cannot be seriously treated today, because today we have quite different physics than Aristotelian. Right? We have moved forward a little bit, at least in this respect. But uh, when we consider demons metaphorically, they could uh, mean some kind of a human psychological obsession. Right? And this obsession, to this obsession, some Vitello's advice could be applied. For example, don't be too emotional. Right? Don't uh, panic. Don't fall in love uh, too deeply, let's say. But, but, is it something new? No. This is a piece of advice that you can easily find in the writings of Greek philosophers. Right? To not to be carried away by your emotions. Right? So this is a piece of advice very common in philosophy. Well, it could be viable for research But in this case, in my opinion, money is the decisive argument. Money is the result here. Yeah. It is the result. But okay, too, 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 many, too many people profit from it. Right? It's not a problem. Question? And we have one more question. Oh. Oh. So, in the title of your lecture, you've mentioned that Spitel is the first Polish philosopher. In Poland. In Poland. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that's an important difference. <laughs> Let's check it. Uh, in, Poland. in Poland. In Poland. I don't know for the public university. In Poland. <laughs> yeah. So, right. Yeah. Maybe this consideration has changed a little bit in my mind. Okay. But what was happening before? Was there some philosophy in Poland before Vitello or not? <sighs> it is a very difficult question. Because uh, the university in Krakow was founded at first in the year 1364, so 14th century. But this university didn't last long. His found, uh, the founder of this university, Kazimierz Wielki, Kazimir the Great, when he died, the university uh, what happened to this university? In fact, as far as I remember, the buildings of the university were not finished by the time of his death, right? And this first university promoted only six magisters of philosophy. Six magisters. But when this university was, uh, how to call it, renowned by the Jagiellonian dynasty in the year 1400, so the situation changed. But this first university was really poor, and our knowledge of this university is poor as well. We know for sure that there was no theology faculty, because the king in Krakow was conflicted with local bishop, and to have a theological faculty, the bishop's um, what is agreement and the agreement of the pope was necessary to have a theological faculty. Uh, but before, 
there was, in the 13th century, there was a school of the Dominican order in Krakow, and they were teaching some philosophy in this school. And we also have a very interesting testimony. We have a list of books, which are a catalog of books, although probably the catalog is a too strong word for it, because there were 30 or 40 books in this catalog. This was the property of one of the first bishops of Krakow. And in this collection of his books, we have certainly books which, was which were necessary for him to do his job as a bishop. But also we have, uh, I'm sure that he had uh, the Consolazione Philosophiae of Poetius the Roman, Poetius Amicius Marcus Severinus, uh, yeah, on the consolation of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And if I remember well, there was also a copy of Confessions of Augustine. Mm -hmm. I'm sure about Boetius, not sure about uh, Augustine. And this is very probable that he also had the etymologies by Isidore of Seville, the 7th seventh century scholar. Which, so, so that is all probably where I can like say. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, oh, maybe one more information to supplement. There is also a testimony of some Arab traveler who traveled in this area, and uh, this is very frequently quoted by Polish historians, because he wrote in his uh, book that he was in Krakow, and he met there uh, many scholars of fundamental knowledge. So those could be also some philosophers. <laughs> but I cannot say anything. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you, uh, you told that uh, he was a uh, Catholic, uh, but uh, his views uh, was uh, not typical uh, medi medieval uh, Catholic views, uh, philosophical. Uh, so, uh, what was the reaction uh, to Vitello's uh, views uh, from Catholic Church? Very good question. Uh, I would say that there was no reaction. <laughs> because this was a, a letter which was at first intended to be a private letter to his friend, priest. Mm -hmm. But we know that in the second half of the 13th century, some ideas that Vitello included in his letter were condemned by the bishops of Paris and then by the Pope. Mm -hmm. So if his letter had been more widely known, who knows? Maybe he would be would have been condemned. But as you saw, all the time he refers to the Christian faith. Just, he says, if we put the Christian faith aside, but the Christian faith is true, then we could adhere to Plato, for example. Right? And this was the common practice of Averroist philosophers, whose views were heterodoxical. There is one great example, I know this example because the book of this philosopher of the 16th century, Pietro Pomponazzi, it was translated into Polish and I've read it and it's a marvelous uh, example of some kind of totalitarian state of mind. Because he considers the issue of the immortality of the soul and he, in his penultimate chapter of his book, he adheres to the upper view that, in fact, there is one common intellect, one common intellect. But in his final chapter, he says, all I said before was only based on human intellect and on human observation, and they all are fallible, but we all know that the truth is in the Catholic Church, which is supported by the apostolic tradition, by the tradition of the Church Fathers, and the Holy Scriptures, and so on, and so on, and so on. If we removed this last chapter, his conclusion would be heterodoxical. But this chapter is dead, right? To be, to be covered. <laughs> so. And uh, I read that uh, he was related with uh, Portugal, but uh, uh, I haven't uh, found information how he was related. But who? Vitello? Vitello, yes. To Portugal? Yes. In no way. <laughs> to Portugal. Mm -hmm. I read that he was related. Mm -hmm.
His journeys were as far as we know as Paris, Lyon, and Rome. Not no further west. But maybe this could be a legend of this uh, 30 year, 30 final years of his life, but maybe he decided to retire and go to Portugal. <laughs> but I, I don't think so. I, I tried to check her. Thank you. I know that Paris was a center for Catholic uh, theologists and scientists, and that is why Portugal uh, influence uh, could be uh, um, uh, unknown facts uh, of uh, theological life of Europe, unknown for us, for example, in um, origin of natural history or philosophy within the uh, Soviet or uh, Ukrainian uh, history world. But my question is, Vitello and uh, Vitello's theory of uh, demons and uh, Francis Bacon, uh, his theory of idolomanes. Are there any links or no? Or maybe Roger Bacon too. Roger Bacon too, but... but. Well, Roger Bacon is, um, it was a philosopher, if I remember well, a little bit older than Vitello. And Roger Bacon was also a naturally oriented philosopher, and Vitello knew some of his works. Most likely he knew of some of his works. But when we uh, try to find the connection with Vitello and Francis Bacon, this would be more difficult. Because there is, I would say that there is no historical connection, but some similarities. Right? This theory of four kinds of idols in Francis Bacon, and the way to, uh, he gives the methods to get rid of illusions, um, this is similar to this disillusioned yes, world by Vitello. But uh, we should keep in mind that this is a very common practice of many philosophers who at first applied some negative method, right, and then built the positive theory. This is the same with Descartes, the same with Plato, right, so they, they all need to remove the apparent knowledge, right, the false knowledge, which is not knowledge at all, then to build the true building of knowledge. So, in Vitello's case, we have this negative part to uh, which refers to illusions, and then the positive part, the theory of demons as animals based on physics, observation, and reasoning. Uh, Francis uh, uh, Bacon has Novo Morgan as the same type of uh, resolving the influence uh, of uh, Idolomenkis. But also, no, no, if this Novo Morgan, this work had been finished, we would have this building yes. of knowledge uh, in full. But some of these, his ideas can be also um, reconstructed in his New Atlantis, in the story of the New Atlantis, how he imagined that knowledge can be built. But first of all, this negative part must be applied. So, this is his theory of idols. Thank you. One minute left in the answer. Any other questions? Should I say something? Oh, but that's all the questions there. Okay. Uh, I should say, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>